Hey guys, it's Gotea here. Before we start the video, I just want to thank each and every one of you for just supporting this channel and, and giving me great ideas for new videos and new content. It's very much appreciated. If you want to help me out, please subscribe to the channel as well as hit that notification bell to get real-time updates for when I release any new content. So, without further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy the video. When I was about 15 or 16 years old, I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to get my Advanced Open Water PADI certification for scuba diving. For Advanced Open Water certifications, you have to choose three specialties to pursue in order to broaden your knowledge as a diver. I chose fish identification, deep diving, and night diving. My group decided to follow me on the last two, so we did a big group night dive to over 100 feet down. The place we dove was off the coast of Catalina Island, off the shore of California. This is one of the best places to dive in the whole world. Awesome visibility, 40 feet minimum, amazing depth of color and variety of fish and sea life. The other, I guess, cool part is that there are a lot of dense kelp forests. Normally this is exciting and very exhilarating, but sadly, not this day. For a night dive, you obviously dive at night with flashlights in order to see. My plan this trip was to use the night time to get some sea life identification that I can't get during the day to speed up my certification on that specialty and try to squeeze a fourth in on the same trip to be closer to rescue diving and dive mastery. My plan was known to the group and we set off with our dive master. Everything was amazing for the first 30 minutes or so. Awesome nighttime visibility, plenty of sea life, a warm summer night overall. I was identifying fish left and right, showing the group and pointing them around. However, once we were about 130 feet down, shit hit the fan. I was second in the cluster behind my dive master. One of my friends was third, and we could tell he was getting a bit scared and jumpy. This is 100% understandable, as we are in the ocean, at night, over a hundred feet down, and at this time, we are only basic certified, which is usually good, to about 75 feet. My buddy wants to go ahead of me, and he lets me know with hand signals. I signal him to go ahead of me, so he can be more comfortable and that we have a safer and more enjoyable dive. The problem was, we were in a kelp forest. Using the flashlight is crucial, and you can use it to signal from fat, protect, observe, and a ton more. Our dive master was signaling that there was a rock slash cave to our left and to not go near it. We're not certified for cave diving at this time because there can be funky pressure changes, temperature changes, and a ton of dangers from simple rock formation protrusions. My buddy saw this slide and from what he told us, he thought we were going that way. From what he says, he slightly panicked as he thought the dive master was already gone as he could not see him anymore. He quickly turned to the side and began kicking his fins very hard in order to follow this trail. The issue is that when he spun around and began to kick hard, he hit me in the face with his fin. My mask was almost completely taken off my face, and more importantly, my regulator used for breathing was knocked completely out. So here I am, deep in the ocean, cold water hitting my face after being warm in the goggles for almost an hour, no regulator to breathe with and no way to see. I started to panic, of course, playing memories over in my head. This was a literal worst case scenario we saw in all the videos that we watched for training. After what seemed like an eternity, I got myself together a bit and thought of what to do next. Normally how you recover your primary regulator is by turning your body to face the position where your primary regular comes out of your air tank and make a large sweeping motion with your arm in order to locate your regulator and subsequently put it back in your mouth and breathe. That being said, however, the issue here is that I was in a kelp forest, so all I was grabbing was kelp. I could not find a way to reach my regulator without my sight. After a bit more thinking and admittedly panicking, I remember that my BCD, best to go up and down, exhausts air from the tank. They teach you this very briefly. So, thinking quick and keeping my air supply in mind, I start to ascend some, then let some air out to breathe. I don't need a ton of air as I'm not exerting my body, but I am panicking and breathing very quickly. 
After a few minutes of this, I'm far enough up in the kelp that it's not super dense and I can finally recover my regulator and purge it. Once I do that, I go ahead and relax for a second, and get my mask on and purge that as well. And for those of you who don't know what purging is, it is releasing air to remove any water trapped in your goggles or your regulator. I can now see two lights below me searching, so I start flashing my light from above. My dive master and buddy see it, come up to me about 15 feet up and signal if I'm okay. I signal that I'm fine, but stressed. At that time, I also had a writing board on me, so I briefly described what just went on and signaled my air gauge. I had just enough to get to the top, but we played it safe and did buddy breathing while we took a slow ascent. We had to go slow for me, as I went too high too fast in my recovery and had to prevent nitrogen bubbles in my blood. After we got to the surface, I explained what happened and ended up getting part of my rescue diver signed off for my distressed recovery. Overall, this was a very scary and frantic, but exceptionally thrilling time. I wouldn't want to do it again on purpose, but it is one of my strongest memories of diving. I was a dive master on a live abroad in the Bahamas in 1992. We were diving at a place called Eric's Blue Hole. The boat was a large steel crew boat converted for diving. The Miss Lindsay, run out of Lynn Haven Dive Center in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and Zandu Dive Center in Freeport, Grand Bahamas. So there were no mooring buoys back then, buoys that lead you to the dive site. So we would take a line down with a wreck hook on it, wrap it around the base of the coral head, and hook it back to itself. Done correctly, it would do no damage to the coral whatsoever. So I'd take the line down, take it around the coral head, and hook it off to itself. It's a choppy day and the boat is bouncing around appreciably above us and it's giving the line a pretty good tug as it goes tight. I lay off and watch it for about a minute and satisfied it's going to hold and it's not wrecking the coral, I start to rise up over the coral head to ascend back up to the line to the surface. Just as I cross over the top of the coral head, the boat lurches hard and the wreck hook, which looks like a giant treble hook, breaks loose, snaps around the circle like a rocket, and headed straight to me like it was shot out of a cannon. I was looking down at it when it happened, and even so, had zero opportunity to do a damn thing but watch it unfold in what seemed like slow motion. For some time, I had been in the habit of clipping my dive computer on my BC across my chest. It kept it from dragging behind me, bouncing off stuff, and it was always close at hand for me to check. By nothing but sheer luck, the wreck hook got me in the chest, dead center of my dive computer. It gutted the dive computer, bounced off my face mask right at the left eye, pulling the mask off my face, and went on its merry way. I had not a single scratch or bruise. I caught my mask in the water and my dive computer was destroyed, but didn't free flow. I could have taken that hook right to the heart, or the left eye, or it could have left my air supply compromised. Somehow, I dodged all three outcomes and made a safe ascent. Which is not to say I didn't suck down most of my air in my tank, hyperventilating before I got there. I didn't even have to wash my dive skin. In 1999, I was still a relatively inexperienced diver. Only 500 dives and about 300 hours time very limited technical experience and I was asked to be a cleanup man during a night dive onto a submerged World War II plane wreck in Badin Lake, a hydro dam formed reservoir, at about 125 feet using only compressed air. It was very murky conditions, visibility to 20 feet depending on thermocline and depth. The group of 12 divers was staggered in and we each had about 8 minutes of bottom time at the wreck. A dive line was dropped onto target, and two by two, we all went down to the plane. All goes without a hitch. That is, until I am on a sent back up to the dive line to the decompression stop. I am the cleanup man, the last diver on the rope, and I remember counting all eleven others passing by me on the way up to the top. I remember detangling the anchor weight from the wreck and looking up and seeing my buddy above me by about 15 or 20 feet. I remember the details exactly, like a touchstone on what can go wrong when diving. 
At exactly 101 feet, I feel a light touch on my shoulder, and suddenly my ascent stopped dead. Within 10 seconds, my buddy's light completely disappeared above me in the murkiness. I could not move up or down. I shined my flashlight up towards my buddy, swirled it, and was trying to catch his attention. Nothing. I was now all alone. I looked up and around and realized that the dive line had drifted onto a stand of submerged trees and that my regulation line and BC were now completely tangled in the tree branches. I was totally fucking stuck. After exactly two minutes, I knew my buddy would not be coming back. He's 13 minutes and two stops from the surface and I'm still stuck down here, 16 minutes from out of air. To this day, I've tried to figure out how 15 foot long tree limbs, four to five inches in diameter, can fully surround and entangle a person with no real warning. But it happened. I tried breaking the limbs. That didn't work. They just bent like rubber from 70 years of being underwater. I tried cutting them with my knife, but it was like trying to cut a piece of steel with a pocket knife. I took a glance of what I had to work with and finally decided to use my haul bag drag line and tie myself to the dive line. With my haul bag line tied to my waist and dive line, I unhooked myself from the BC and spent the next seven minutes extracting my tank and regulator lines from the trees. I tied off the tank from the valve and onto my left arm and then cut away the BC from the trees. I wrote a note on the grease board, emergency, drop full tanks on line now, send help, inflated the BC, unhooked it, and sent it shooting free up to the surface. I'm naturally negatively buoyant, so between the exertion of getting out of the trees and BC, the stress, and my slowly dwindling air, it took another four to five minutes to get to the 70 foot decompression stop, using my haul bag line and dragging my tank on my arm. By now, I'm a full 12 minutes past due for decompression stop number one. I've been down too long already, and I have perhaps two minutes of air left before I choose to try a rapid emergency ascent despite my negative buoyancy. Two minutes later, I ran out of air. I'm not really sure where my decision came from, but I somehow decided to begin pulling myself up slowly, arm over arm, no faster than the bubbles. I was this fucking close to doing a panic launch. Exhale was my last conscious thought and watching the bubbles rise is the last thing I remember. Apparently, according to my computer, the ETA of PSI and dive times don't exactly match. Because I blacked out at about 65 feet and I began to sink. When I regained consciousness, I had a regulator in my mouth. I was breathing, and although totally disoriented, I was surrounded by what seemed like 50 other divers for a 14 minute decompression stop at 80 feet. I also swapped tanks at 60 feet for 17 minutes, then slow rised to another swap for 19 minutes at 35 feet. And the final full tank at 9 feet, right under the light of the pontoon, that I breathed in lungfuls for nearly 40 minutes before finally climbing out of the water. This is the price you have to pay to avoid decompression sickness. That night, I climbed back onto the dive pontoon and tried to regain my composure. There are some things in life that can't be minimized, and I realized how close to death I had actually been, and I realized how there were eight divers who went back in for me after seeing my floating BC pop up, and who risked their own lives to save a complete stranger, and how that whole event has stuck with me for the past 20 plus years of diving. To all my rescuers, and you all know who you are from the Baden B-29 missions, David, Shelley, Scott, Matt, Brian, Mike, Rue, and Chris, I can never thank you enough. Your beers are always on me. People, diving is a wonderful sport, and 99.9% .9 of the times, things go terrifically, but just in case shit doesn't go as planned, you need to make sure you, one, always have a buddy plan. Two, always have redundancy in your buddy plan. And three, have buddies you can trust to make the right decisions with a random pop-up BC. Hey guys, it's Gotea here. I want to say thank you so much for listening to this video. 
Diving is pretty scary. I just recently got certified and it's truly an incredible thing, but humans are pretty interesting creatures. We're basically apes, so whenever we go underwater, we always have limited air supply. And things can go horribly wrong. I myself have not personally gone through any of those experiences, but I really don't hope I ever have to. So, if any of you have any stories you would like me to share in future videos, please send them to me via my personal email linked in the description below, and I'll be sure to include them in future content. So, thank you so much for watching again, and I will see you mates in the next episode.